okay, so what do you do with blue waters? <laughs> I, uh, I want to show you about uh, one of the most exciting questions there is, namely, what is life? The smallest living thing is the living cell. There's nothing smaller than is living. A living cell is made of many molecules, macromolecules. In fact, the living cell has as many macromolecules as the United States as citizens. And that's a very good comparison because these molecules in the cell form a society. They assemble and they work together. And uh, that is what uh, life science and medicine tries to understand. The problem is to look at all this detail, to see what all these molecule citizens do in the cell. There are many microscopes that have been tried, for example, the famous light microscope, but it cannot resolve the citizens. And uh, it is a computer that is actually today finally permitting us to see the citizens at work. The citizens that in some cases just built pipes and in some other cases amazing machines that read the, the, the genetic information and turn it into new proteins of the cell or to, to harvest the sunlight to solve the energy problem of nature. So this computational microscope is not made of glass and metal, but it is made of software. The software runs on very simple computers, like a laptop, or in the extreme, on, as you see there, you see there the number, uh, over 32,000 processors of one of the biggest machines that are available today to mankind, and it will also run on the blue waters uh, that we heard about. Just like Boeing designing its new aircraft, we are simulating with these computers the helicopters, the, the small planes and the big planes that are cruising through the cell as molecules. A molecule is very small, yet it takes enormous computer power to simulate uh, them. And you will see here a small molecule on the left that is uh, generating the electrical signals in nerve cells to a virus on the right that is infecting, this is a polio, this is a related to polio virus, that is infecting human cells. The program is used by many people, 32,000 uh, registered users all over the world. But even more important than computing is looking with your eyes, understanding. And uh, the cell is so complicated, with, uh, made of so many molecules and atoms, that you need a tool to think. That tool to think is a program VMD. Carl Vos, one of our wisest men on our campus, calls it uh, the tool to think. And you see there on the left, on the top left, a buckyball vibrating. You see on the right a molecule that we know from the doctor's office as good cholesterol that is uh, scooping up the cholesterol in our uh, blood veins. Uh, you see on the bottom left an amazing new picture of actually quantum mechanical particles moving, namely the electrons of the buckyball, that move actually like oscillating clouds rather than like, uh, like points moving through sphere. And on the right, you see an entire cell uh, with ribosomes, hundreds of ribosomes that are reading the genetic information and interpreting it for the cell. Now let's get going to see real the, the computational microscope really at work. Here I have the first example, just a little protein. The protein is called villain headpiece, the name is not important, and we stretch it out in the computer, but we leave as a shadow the form of the protein as it is observed since many years in crystallography. 
And you see how the computer folds a protein back into its shape in the cell. So you see the computer can actually handle and simulate uh, these proteins so accurately that at the very end you're getting this amazing agreement uh, between the computed protein and uh, the real protein. Now let's uh, do the opposite from folding, stretching a protein apart. That's also an important function of proteins. For example, the protein fibrinogen. That is a protein that holds blood clots together. Scare, scare, blood clot. It's a very important, uh, the blood clot, it, uh, it heals our wounds. It strings together the tissue uh, so that the, the wound is closed. But the blood clot is also dangerous when it forms too quickly and is brittle so that it breaks off and gives rise to heart attacks and strokes. And here's a combination of experiment, oops, of experiment, oops, um, where one pulls the protein that holds a blood clot together, called fibrinogen, and where one computes at the same time the same thing. Here you see the, the experiment in red from Bernard Lim, he's a cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic, who gets the blood clots from fresh infarct patients. Just a few minutes after they're delivered at the hospital, he gets their blood and measures the fibrinogen to see what is going wrong there. And we stretch it out and we measure the same thing. What force do we need to stretch this fibrinogen? And we agree nicely with what he measures at the Mayo Clinic. But we see more. We see all the chemical detail that happens as you stretch out the fibrinogen. And so we can then tell the pharmacologist how to manage the blood clot chemically, how to change pH, add calcium, and do other things in order to avoid the brittleness of the pathological blood clot. Again, you saw first and here that we always have to compare with observation to be sure that our um, computational microscope is not leading us astray, but we see very, very nicely agreement. Here we have a somewhat mundane situation in the cell. The cell, you cannot see that too well because it's a little dark here, is uh, made of many containers and pipes that connect them. And these containers are made of membranes. And if you put a membrane on a dish and study it as a, a life scientist, they are flat. But in the cell, they have wonderful, numerous forms. Where do they come from? And here's the answer from, from the computational microscope. You see here that there is an army of proteins that, that attach themselves to the membrane and curve it around that it forms, in this case, this particular pipe. I don't want to show you the experimental evidence, but electron microscopy shows exactly this kind of pattern of, um, of proteins uh, that is doing the job. And so we are seeing uh, a very good agreement with, uh, with the computational microscope showing us this process. Now I want to go to a much more exciting process, the most important machinery in living cells that reads genetic information and produces the proteins that give a living cell all its functions, from the muscle cell to the brain cell. And this uh, machine is called the ribosome. You see here the ribosome uh, in blue and yellow. It sits on top of a membrane because in this case, it produces protein, fresh protein, that is being excreted through the membrane or weaved into the membrane. This is a hugely complicated machine made of millions of atoms. And uh, how do we 
get this to, to view through the computational microscope. The computational microscope teams up. It teams up with crystallographers at the electron storage rings, like at Argon Lab uh, up the road uh, near Chicago. It teams up with electron microscopists, like uh, at Columbia University, where they have uh, instruments that cost about a $10 million piece. The, the argon people see the detail, but only the protein standing still. The Columbia electron microscopists see the motion in action, the protein, but only at the cloud. And now one needs to know the detail as a protein is doing the function, and you see how the computer can bring the two together. It says, oh, if, we, if I take this protein and I just move it into the cloud, I see what the head is doing and what the legs are doing, and thereby I can understand even a machine as big and complex as a ribosome that is in all living cells reading the genetic information. And here you see the ribosome, you saw the cloud, you see the, 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 the structure from the crystallographer. So now you see how the computer can, can weave the structure that is observed at argon into the electron density that is observed at Columbia University and see the form of the ribosome. And at the very end, it gets in a beautifully detailed picture of the gray cloud on the left, the detail on the right permitting views. And here we see for the first time a nascent protein, a protein being born. It's a green strand there that you see coming from the top and going through this membrane, weaving straight through and coming back the first time that the protein was observed at birth. The most important problem probably for mankind today and for, for, um, for nature is the energy problem. Nature is around longer, billion of years. It tried many solutions and it found a solution. It found actually pretty much one solution, namely one that is shared by 95% of all life on Earth. And that solution is called photosynthesis. You harvest the sunlight and turn it into fuel that the cell uses to run all of its processes. And here you will see one of those uh, photosynthetic life forms that is doing the job. It's a very unfortunate one. You don't see it often. You see mainly the trees and the plants that are in prime real estate, exposed to the sun. But sometimes it's better to learn more to take the unfortunate, to take the smallest, the simplest. And this is uh, the purple bacterium. The purple bacterium does the same photosynthesis as the big plants, but it lives at the bottom of ponds with very few photons, particles of sunlight, that make it to the bottom of the pot. And uh, you see there in brown this uh, bacterium, and you might recognize that there are these little spheres inside. And these little spheres, about 100 per cell, are doing the job. They absorb the sunlight, and they turn it into chemical fuel for the cell. And in the effort that took the computational microscope uh, decades, finally the spheres were, uh, were, were seen in detail. It's a little dark, but you can recognize there are dark green particles, red particles, and blue particles. Those are all proteins. And these proteins contain 4,000 chlorophyll molecules. Those are the molecules that make the plants green. And they absorb the sunlight, and the excitation marches through this sphere of about 250 proteins to reach the blue part. At the blue part, the light excitation energy is turned into a voltage across the surface of the sphere. 
charging the sphere inside positive and outside negative like a solar battery. And this is a solar battery that drives life on Earth to 95%. And this energy is then used by the particle that you see there like a mushroom coming out uh, to synthesize the molecule of ATP in the cell. You are doing the same thing when you eat today, and yesterday did, and do tomorrow. And you are synthesizing every day your body weight of ATP. You're utilizing it immediately, but you are synthesizing, synthesizing. So this is a very, very important fuel for living systems. And this is what this machine can do. And the computational microscope shows us every atom there is. It shows us even more, it even shows us the electrons that absorb the sunlight, that interact with the sunlight. I have now a close view of um, the, the green ring particles, these are ring proteins, and in the next slide you see them at work. You see now one of these ring proteins, you see there these green chlorophylls, the blue are also chlorophylls, and you see the light excitation marching around in a fashion that is dictated by quantum physics. So quantum physics discovered about um, 100 years ago is uh, at work here to really show how uh, living systems absorb the sunlight and turn it into energy. And the computational microscope can go all the way from the cell to the big machines to assemblies of machines like this one, an assembly of proteins, of uh, 250 proteins that absorb the sunlight and make this, uh, this ATP fuel, and uh, thereby showing us in incredible detail the, uh, the functioning and the actions in living cells and explaining us what is life, what is this society of molecules that uh, assemble and cooperate so wonderfully in living systems. Now this is a, a huge uh, effort that actually took us 20 years. Oops, I missed one, can we go back? This is a huge effort that took a, a group of people 20, so just that was right there, uh, 20 years to, to develop. We are, at the, we are at the Beckman Institute. We are funded um, uh, from, the, from the American uh, institutions. And uh, we are physicists. I'm myself a physicist. Uh, my students are physicists mainly, but we are also chemists. We are biologists. We are computer scientists. We are getting the equipment from the National uh, Center for Supercomputing Applications. And uh, this is a big team effort of many types of scientists who made the computational microscope possible. Thank you very much.